Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Derry Fitzgerald, and I'm a member of the Institute. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome our speaker today, Mr. Adam Bugaski. Um, so if I could just go through some routine issues first, and then I will give some background material on uh, Mr. Bugaski. Um, the presentation will last for 20 minutes, 25 minutes, followed by um, a Q&A session. The presentation itself is on the record, and the Q&A session is Chatham House Rules. Um, also, uh, if you choose to follow us on Twitter, please use the handle at IIEA. And one final uh, request, if I could, if you have a question, please raise your hand so we can pick you up. And if you could identify yourself and give us any affiliation that you have. Thank you. Now, Russia, Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine has dramatically changed the European security equation, prompting many European countries to reprioritize security and defense policy. Poland has been among the EU's largest contributors of support to Ukraine in its defense against Russia's unprovoked war of aggression. Furthermore, as one of Europe's top military spenders in terms of GDP, Poland is playing a growing role in European security dynamics, both at the EU and the NATO level. In his address today, um, Mr. Bugaski, Bugaski will address and discuss the impact of Russia's war on European security from the perspective of Poland. And if you could indulge me a little bit more, I'd like to say a few words of Mr. Bugaski himself. He was appointed as the Security Policy Director at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, of Poland in November 2019. In this position, he deals with Polish security policy with regard to NATO, the EU, the OSCE, and other international organizations, as well as bilateral cooperation in security and defense. Prior to his current assignment, he was the permanent representative of Poland to the UN office and the international organizations in Vienna. His previous roles were included the security policy director at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the director, uh, the deputy director of the Department of Strategy and Foreign Policy, and the deputy permanent representative of Poland to NATO. So, a large background there in security matters in Europe. So I'm delighted to introduce Mr. Bugaski. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, General, thank you for the uh, introduction. And I would like to uh, thank all of you for uh, gathering here. Uh, and the staff of the Institute of, of International and European Affairs for inviting me to uh, speak today. I'll be ha happy to present and also to discuss um, the Polish perspective on security in Europe uh, in a rather difficult time of, of war. Um, on February 24, 2022, um, the European security architecture crumbled down and the rules-based international order um, that was supposed to guarantor of um, our peaceful coexistence was rendered ineffective uh, with uh, Russian full-scale aggression against uh, Ukraine. And this was, uh, in our opinion, a turning point, as today we find ourselves um, in uh, a situation of no return to the pre-war order. While we deal with the consequences of the Russian aggression, we, we also have to adapt to this new, dramatically changed security situation. It's hard to fully predict um, how and war, uh, how, how, how and when the war will end, 
But as we uh, reflect on how the se future security order in Europe could um, look like, I would point out four elements that we in Poland see as crucial drivers for our thinking. First, Russia is the most significant and direct threat to Euro-Atlantic security and to peace and stability in Europe. Uh, the unprovoked and unjustified um, invasion brought death and suffering to thousands of innocent men, women and children whose only fault was the dream of freedom, sovereignty and democracy outside of the so-called uh, Ruski's mirror. Uh, despite heavy losses in Ukraine, Russia's wider strategic goals have not changed. It wants to destroy uh, the sovereign Ukraine statehood and, secondly, to revise the European security order. It wants to rebuild its sphere of influence. Belarus is an example of um, uh, the submission that Russia expects. Uh, although it is tempting to assume that distance breeds safety, it is not so in case of Russia. Moscow uh, wages war by any means available, be them open or clandestine. For example, Russia, uh, for Russia, everything can be weaponized. Energy, food, information. Thus, uh, Russia will continue to pose a threat to the whole Europe, and in consequence to the world at large in the foreseeable future. The plans to deploy, uh, to deploy Russian tactical nuclear weapons on the Belarusian territory are, are exactly aimed at escalating long-term threats toward, towards uh, us all. We cannot, we cannot let Russia win or freeze the conflict. That would only serve Moscow as an opportunity to, to regroup and prepare for the next phase of its aggression on other European states. And it would encourage other authoritarian regimes to use threats and armed aggression to pursue their goals. This is why we think that Moscow's strategic defeat in Ukraine is in the interest of all three nations of the world. This, this, that is why Europe should keep standing by Ukraine to its victory. And it, that is why Russia must be stopped and held accountable for the crimes it committed in Ukraine. Second element we identified uh, as crucial is the critical role of the United States for European security. It was Washington that has been leading our efforts to prevent the war. It was the United States that has been advancing the reinforcement of NATO's defense and deterrence on the eastern flank once Russia rejected dialogue. And it is the United States that is spreading our efforts to provide support to fighting Ukrainians. Despite all the rhetorics about uh, US pivot to Asia, the US military presence in Europe has been recently strengthened. Europe should build strategic partnership with the United States and not look for strategic autonomy from the US in security uh, matters. But partnership is a relationship of equals. A strong and capable Europe will be an attractive partner for the US, a partner with which Washington can and should share the responsibility for peace in Europe and for preserving the rules-based international order globally. Third, the war reinforced the relevance and credibility of NATO. The commitment of, uh, of collective defense proved to be the best guarantee of security of members of the North Atlantic Alliance. This was underscored really in a spectacular way by Finland and Sweden walking away from their well, 200-year policy of non-alignment and thus joining NATO. Specific provisions of the Treaty on the European Union could not satisfy those countries' need for safety and security. It was only the Article 5 of the Washington Treaty and NATO member states' potential that had the necessary strength. Poland gladly welcomed the, the sovereign decision of those states to join the alliance. Finland is already a member of NATO, 
once Sweden joins the alliance, 96% of the European Union population will live in a NATO country and therefore will be protected by the provisions of the Washington Treaty. Fourth observation that is guiding our strategic thinking is uh, the necessity to build upon the exemplary complementarity of NATO and the, the EU demonstrated in response to a common threat. Both organizations have worked hand in hand and have made best use of the instruments at their disposal to address the developing situation. While NATO ramped up its def defenses to deter the threat to European territory, the European Union imposed sanctions on Russia and Belarus and provided support to Ukraine. For the first time in its history, the EU decided to purchase and deliver military equipment to support a state in its struggle with a military aggression. Within a couple of months, it set up a military training mission for Ukrainian armed forces. Those were really breakthrough decisions that will further mark the development of the CSDP of the EU. Ladies and gentlemen, our goal, and I mean for all of us, is to restore lasting peace in Europe. This can be achieved only through Ukrainian victory, through respect for the norms of international law and establishment of a more system, systemic institutional barriers that would protect us all from another uh, imperial aggression. To that effect, Poland is ready to cooperate uh, with countries in our direct neighborhood in, in the whole transatlantic community to make sure that uh, those solutions and principles are implemented and respected in Europe. These are long-term criteria for our success. In the short term, in Poland, we focus on assuring our defense and supporting Ukraine. To achieve that, we act on three different levels, national, through NATO, and through the European Union. Our national efforts focus first and foremost on investing in our own security and defense. We have launched an, an unprecedented program of modernization of our armed forces. We are procuring most advanced fighter jets, helicopters, tanks, frigates, and artillery systems. We are restoring military bases in eastern part of the country with aim at increasing the number of troops in the coming years. Those plans are matched with necessary increase in the level of defense spending. We will be spending at least 3% of GDP per year on uh, defense in the coming decade. Due to imminent uh, needs of our military this year, those expenditures will reach over 4% of GDP. NATO is the most fundamental pillar of our uh, defense in the international context. Therefore, the adaptation of NATO's defense and deterrence posture to the new reality remains our priority. In 2016, uh, the Alliance has established an enhanced forward presence in Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, and, Latvia, uh, and Estonia. It was the last year uh, that marked a real turning point in NATO's approach to defense of the eastern flank. NATO accelerated the process of its military adaptation in order to respond to the threat from Russia. It established additional battle groups on the eastern flank and significantly increased the number of Allied troops present along the whole flank. The adaptation continues. After the horrors of Russia uh, atrocities in Bucha, in Irpin, and Mariupol, Poland's priority is to ensure that um, the Alliance deterrence and defense posture is robust enough to prevent any potential aggression aggressor from in intrusion on Allied territory. We hope that by the upcoming NATO summit in Vilnius, we will have in place most of the elements to achieve that goal. We need, for example, the data defense plans, more military uh, capabilities, prepositioned uh, equipment, and faster reaction uh, time. Uh, the new reality will also require the European Union to adapt. I have already mentioned the potential the war in Ukraine woke up, woke up within the uh, security and defense policy of the EU. We, we have to build upon that to further support Ukrainians in defense of their country and defense of Europe. The EU should also 
plan for the recovery and reconstruction of the, of the country after the war. We have to recognize that uh, we have a strategic interest in bringing Ukraine to European Union and eventually to NATO to effectively anchor it in the Euro-Atlantic structures. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Russian war of aggression has a fundamental impact both on the security of uh, on the security and everyday lives of Polish people. While some of our Western partners may still find this war to be a distant matter, countries neighboring Ukraine are faced directly with consequences. Several millions of refugees found shelter in Poland uh, and acquire necessary medical care in my country. Uh, currently, there are probably more than uh, two and a half million uh, Ukrainians on our soil. Uh, 200,000 of Ukrainian children are integrated into the education system, at the same time uh, being given an opportunity to continue virtual classes in uh, Ukraine. While the integration of Ukrainians is progressing uh, smoothly, it still comes at the cost uh, to our economy. Thus, bringing this war to an end is our priority. And the only way to do this is through uh, Ukrainian victory and Russian defeat. To that end, Poland is a key donor of military equipment. Our defense support to Ukraine has amounted by now to more than 3.5 billion euros and is ongoing. Since the beginning of the war, we have donated over 350 tanks to Ukraine. We led a white Leopard coalition and at quickly assembling and equipping two Ukrainian tank battalions. And our decision to transfer our MiG-29 fighter jets was another important step in the field of military assistance to Ukraine. Upon our initiative, the European Union set up a military assistance mission for Ukraine that has already trained more than uh, 15,000 um, Ukrainian soldiers. Poland is hosting uh, the mission's multilateral operation uh, command, as well as providing training for the largest number of Ukrainian soldiers out of all EU countries. We see those actions as a necessity to help Ukrainians, but also as an investment in our own future and the future of whole Europe. But as the outcome of the war in Ukraine will have a fundamental impact on security of all of us, this is a fight all of us need to actively join in, in whatever capacity we can. We should all here in Europe act together and in solidarity to assure the advancement of imperial aggression is halted in Ukraine and by Ukraine in order to restore peace and security on our continent. Lastly, on a personal note, uh, last Friday I was in Kiev and held consultations with my Ukrainian counterparts. And really, I keep my fingers crossed for their, their plans and hope the uh, military efforts will be fully successful, bringing this barbaric war closer to an end. Thank you very much.